The F-A-18 pilot flies one of the most versatile weapons in the military. His plane can fight in the air and attack on the ground. He can defend himself and the fleet against a multitude of threats. And he can perform all these tasks in a single mission. Two, one, two, ten miles sturdy out. But before he can take his aircraft into battle, a Hornet pilot must master a basic yet no less dangerous task. Landing on an aircraft carrier. Somewhere off the coast of California, the VFA-137 is beginning back to sea workup. For the next eight months, they will split their time between the boat and the beach. They will sharpen their fighting skills in preparation for deployment to the Persian Gulf. First, however, they must become carrier qualified, CQ'd, they call it. The ship is really quite exciting. There's a certain point where it's, it's kind of terrifying when you got the ship. Everything's new, everything's confusing. Uh, once you spend a little time around the ship and realize how things work, it gets to be really fun. Very few things can equal flying off the ship. From the commanding officer to his least experienced pilot, a catch shot, a trap, day and night, again and again, until everyone in the squadron qualifies. Early morning, Central California. With dawn comes the first sign of activity at Naval Air Station Lemoore. Soon the stillness will be broken by the steady hum of machines, the rumbling of airplane tugs, the deafening high-pitched scream of jet engines. Before long, the air will be filled with the thunder of fighters. But for a short time, all is quiet. As the ramp comes to life, ground crews focus on getting airplanes ready to fly. Pushing over, somewhere like I said, about 4.4 DME. Inside the ready room, pilots focus their attention hundreds of miles away. All day and well into the night, they will pretend. Pretend that one corner of their landlocked runway is a tiny aircraft carrier deck in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So, that's it, unless there's any other questions. We'll go out, we'll have some fun. Uh, take it seriously, the boat's a week away, we'll all be CQing, probably Tuesday or Wednesday, so take it seriously, be motivated. Try and forget there's 13,000 feet of runway ahead of you when you touch down. It's just another morning at the home of VFA-137. An FA-18 squadron, nicknamed the Kestrel, just another morning, one week before CQ. Air qualification is just uh, going out and demonstrating uh, the demonstrating proficiency in carrier landing. That's the, uh, the basis of naval aviation. We can't do anything if we can't launch and recover safely. Thanks, Senior. Yes, sir. Have a good flight. Landing on a carrier is what separates naval aviators from the rest of the world. And staying qualified requires repetition. It's not like riding a bike. Strapping a G suit on. Requalification is a test of skill that no one takes lightly. Every pilot in the squadron has to pass no matter how much experience he has or how many carrier landings he has made. The, the younger guys will take uh, six months to get adapted enough uh, or comfortable enough flying around the ship. An older guy that's been around a little bit that has, uh, say, four or five hundred uh, arrested landings under his belt, he'll take about a week or so to get, get back under, back ready. Lieutenant Commander Lance Buell, call sign JP, is one of the Kestrel's more experienced pilots. He has made 600 carrier landings in his career. But just like everyone else in the squadron today, he will practice his landing. Navy pilots call it bouncing. So we go out here and we, we fly the same pattern that we fly at the ship. 
Uh, we fly the, uh, the Fresnel lens all the way to touchdown, and we land in the carrier box, and then we uh, add full power, and we go around and we do it again. For a total of about 60 or 70 uh, actual touchdowns. Uh, and that's the kind of training and the amount of uh, landings that's required to get a pilot uh, comfortable and proficient in the landing pattern and flying the, the Fresnel lens, or the ball as we call it, uh, out of the ship. Go for it, Evan. The Fresnel lens, called meatball, or just plain ball, is the primary landing aid for carrier pilots. It provides a stationary reference for landing on a moving surface. The plane's relative position to the lens determines what light the pilot sees. And the lights he sees tell him whether he's lined up for a safe landing. As you cross the ramp, you, your peripheral vision sees the flight deck coming up to meet the airplane but you can't afford to take your eyes off the lens to look at the flight deck. You have to keep your eyes on the lens, making corrections to glide slope all the way to touchdown. So that landing is violent, it's a surprise, and then, and you know you've done it right when you come to a full stop pretty quickly. But the ball is just one tool these pilots will use to land their planes. Lieutenant Hal Schmidt, call sign Bull, will be another. He's one of two current LSOs, or landing signal officers, for the squadron. Shipmates will call him Paddle. It's a reference to earlier carrier days when LSOs literally weigh planes in with two large paddles. Today, the technology is more sophisticated, but the job is still very basic. Watch and direct every landing. Make sure every landing is safe. Their vantage point is mere feet from the touchdown point. Today, that's a runway. Next week, it'll be a carrier deck. What we're doing, the, uh, the LSO pretty much judges where the aircraft is on the glide slope, on the proper glide slope. So what we're doing here is we'll stand out at the end of the runway as we'll do on the ship, and we'll grade each of the aircraft's pass. We'll evaluate what the pilot did uh, in relation to glide slope and center line of here, the runway, or two out of the ship. So what we'll do is we'll watch it, and we'll see what deviations he made. Fly through down in, close, low flat the ramp. Below. Waving planes, as it's called, is more an art than a science. An art that comes with practice, a keen eye, and thousands of passes make a good LSO. If an airplane is not on glide scope, the LSO will wave it off and send the pilot around to try again. On a carrier deck, there is no margin for error. LSO scrutinize each landing with an impartial eye, whether the pilot is the newest member of the squadron or the commander of the air wing. Not a bad attitude on line up in close. A little low flat at the ramp. The grade for each pass okay, is pass. recorded in a log book. At the end of the day, each pilot receives a report card a complete picture of his landing from the beginning to the end. Out of 405 here, a little too much power and close, a little high at the ramp. That's a great pass. He nailed center line, he nailed uh, glide slope right from the start, and was able to keep it there until the end close and just added a little too much power, drive him so, drive himself maybe about a foot or two high uh, at touchdown, which, which really isn't very much. And LSO's comments today may make the difference for a safe landing some other day. We're going to go back to the pilot and say, here's what you did today, and here's how you can improve for tomorrow. So it's one, keep them safe, and two, uh, allow them to learn for the next day. The Kestrels returned from their last cruise in the fall of 1997. As they near their necks, the pace of their day quickens. Their day also gets longer, extending well into the night. But 12 to 14 hours a day this week will seem insignificant later. Once they get to the ship, time will have no meaning. Uh, when you get out to the ship, they own you for 24 hours, however long you're out there, so uh, it's busy. We have a nice level break tonight, getting ourselves somewhere near the 1.3 to 1.5 of beam. Before down. night bounces, the Kestrels brief again. Procedures are grilled and repeated until they're reflex. Instinctive habits are crucial under the pressure of flying at sea. Remember being up on the deck? We get uh, 
you know, up on the boat, coming near the edge of the uh, deck there. Second that nose wheel goes off, we're out of the ejection envelope. So good timely ejection decision. If you can't get the airplane stopped by ground looping or some other means, timely ejection decision, get out of the airplane. Uh, especially important for those uh, bigger guys, XO, CAG, the guys whose seat's probably going to push you up a few feet uh, and then the chute will pop out. Bull has already had a full day, but his night will be even busier. From here, he'll go to the LSO shack and wave the first group of pilots. Then he'll race back to the hangar, suit up, pre-flight, and head out to do his own bounces. At that point, he'll hand over waving duties to Lieutenant E.C. White III. Call sign, Vanna. All right. Giddy up. Manny De La Fuente, call sign Gimp, is new to the Kestrels. This will be his first trip to the boat as part of a fleet squadron. He knows the rest of the squadron is watching. This is the first time we go back to the ship. You know, it's uh, for me, it, it's important to go out there and do well. Um, just because every, you know, obviously as a new guy, everybody's looking at you and stuff like that. They want to make sure you're safe to operate around the ship and all that. So for me, it's just important, you know, I just go out there and do well and, uh, and not join attention to yourself. That's basically that's the bottom line. This is tonight. I mean, it's pretty. You know, tonight's pretty simple. So you know, I won't get too wound up. But but uh, when you have to vote, by this time I'd already be real real wound up. Practice and repetition. One after another, the Kestrels hit the concrete, add full power, take off again, over and over. Yeah, that was Gimp. He was uh, he was high. The goal to make their actions more than habit, to make them instinct. In a four-hour period tonight, Kestrel pilots will hit the runway about 60 times. A four-hour period that brings them another day and another step closer to the carrier. But simulation is not the real thing. In the relatively low-stress atmosphere of landing on a long and stationary runway, it's easy for a pilot to do well. So easy, in fact, that he has to fight the tendency to become overconfident. Of course, there's always, uh, you know, being human, we're going to get a little complacent about things we've done right. But uh, that's why we try in the brief to get guys focused back on. Here's the task at hand. We can't allow ourselves to get complacent because not the ship. I can guarantee you won't be complacent there. It is literally the stuff of legend. Naval aviation immortalized in movies and television from the vantage point of an FA-18 cockpit. It is a job that does not disappoint. Real pretty down there. Flying has been a lifelong dream for many of the men in VFA-137. Some were inspired by on-screen heroes. I don't know, I guess it's just, you know, I don't, I don't know, I was watching Happy Boy and when you're a kid or whatever, but, uh, you know, it's just something I always wanted to do. Thanks for the plug, kid. Other squadron members found role models closer to home. I was about five years old, and I was flying with my dad in a Cessna. And after flying with him over several years, I decided that's truly what I wanted to do. But all join the Navy because of the challenge of naval aviation, a challenge that begins on land. Yet the Hornet's natural habitat is the sea, and its nest, the aircraft carrier. In a few days, VFA-137 will move its entire operation over 300 miles to the USS Constellation in San Diego Bay. We must be going to the ship this week or something, huh? I know the mechs love it. You guys love having work to do, right? Yes, sir. Thought so. Commander Stephen Smith, call sign Oski, is the squadron CO. It is ultimately his job to make sure everyone and everything is ready for the boat. Today, that means taking a Hornet for a test drive of sorts, a maintenance check flight, making sure the plane flies correctly following some recent work. Smith has been with VFA-137 since 1996. He came on board as an executive officer, then took command of the squadron in December of 1997. Today, it's one of the most popular Hornet squadrons at Lemoore. 
I do like to, I guess to use a buzzword of empower, I like to empower people. I like to allow people to do what it is they want to do um, with the objective of achieving the goal, doing it smarter, better. That means relying on senior officers for their experience and leadership. We have uh, four brand new guys. It will be my responsibility to you know, ensure that they know what's going on, that they have the benefit of my experience out there. And we conduct training uh, on a weekly basis, and we talk to these guys about what they can expect about the aircraft carrier itself, um, about landing on the ship, and we just you know, impart as much knowledge on them as we can. And they're really receptive to that because they've never seen this. They've never done this before. This type of teamwork is critical to naval aviation, a dangerous and demanding profession at best. And it extends throughout the entire squadron, from the ground crew to maintenance personnel. Uh, there's no way. I mean, uh, uh, with today, uh, the way the aviation's going, I mean, you got to put forth a good effort to give a good product for the pilot. So when he gets in, you know, he's going to get 100% of what the jet's available to do while he's out there. Everything the Kestrels do on land prepares them for going to sea. But a squadron's effectiveness also relies on less tangible factors, like family support. When we're at home, I'm usually not home. And obviously when I'm on the ship, I'm not coming home. So she puts up with a lot of stuff. And uh, it's great to have that support at home. It's a real understanding. So she understands how, how dangerous it is. But she also knows that, that we're trained. Uh, we, we train a lot. We're very proficient in what we do, and we're also not risk takers, so we're going to be as careful as possible. So she accepts it, doesn't really like it, uh, but she accepts it. I think it takes a special kind of person to uh, leave their husband for six months at a time and, and know that everything's going to be okay and know that, that I'm going to come home. That, that support that you have in, at home and in the family is crucial to uh, being a successful fighter pilot. And so are the relationships that develop within each squadron. Uh, camaraderie is great. A lot is always said about that in naval aviation. It's, it's not so much what we do, it's who you do it with. And that is definitely the case here. We have a great group of guys. Uh, it really becomes a surrogate family. And uh, you do everything with these guys. You know, you'll, you'll live with them, eat with them, you perhaps go to war with them. Uh, they're the guys that you're going to save. They're going to save you. Uh, I love it here. I love these guys, uh, just like they're my family. With just days till departure, final preparations began. In the Kestrel hangar, that meant packing. Packing for a squadron is a balancing act. Pack enough to keep your plane flying. Don't pack more than you can fit on board ship. Fine instruments. You realize, hey, I'm about at a mile. What's a good clue for that? Yeah, right out just went off a moment ago. Let's look outside. Up in the ready room, final preparations means a review of procedures. I'll continue on with some of the uh, case approaches. The LSOs go over every detail, from takeoff at Lemoore to trapping patterns at the ship. Uh, 2,000 feet, that's the Tomcats. We need a little more time on deck, and the F-18s and the Snakes. Next week, they will execute what they reviewed today. Another thing with our aircraft lighting, realize that it's going to be bright as day above those clouds and really, really, really dark underneath. No horizon, nothing. It's going to suck. Next week, it'll have to be second nature. There may be no time to think. It's going to be miserable. You're going to have all your lights up bright. Dang, good chance that layer is somewhere inside the, uh, the tip over point. So, varsity move there, but you got to do it. Although an aircraft carrier's primary purpose is flight operation, it's a foreign and hostile environment to pilots. The ship is following its habit pattern, and its habit pattern is consistent. You know, they're into the wind, they want to land uh, airplanes, they want to shoot airplanes, um, and they want to kill you, right? Everything on the ship is there to kill you. So, uh, now that sounds kind of harsh, but the point I'm trying to make is, recall that we want to control our own destiny. We want to be in control of everything that goes on on the ship. The minute you get behind, you start letting the ship control you uh, it gets you, it can put you in a bad situation in a hurt longer. The carrier is inherently unsafe. It's made safe by your procedures, 
your preparation and your habit pattern. I'm getting excited. I'm ready to go. Any questions for me? Right? Ready? Break. Okay, on the flight deck, we're now underway. All covers, take them off there, shipmate. Take them off. We're underway. The United States has 11 aircraft carriers stationed around the country and deployed around the world. One of the oldest in the fleet is the USS Constellation. She is affectionately called the Connie. Commissioned in 1961, she's been based in San Diego since 1962. This 17-story floating mass of steel is home to more than 3,000 sailors. With a carrier air wing on board, her population nears 5,000. Half the squadron pilots have walked onto the Connie. The rest will fly the Kestrel Hornets out to meet the ship underway. At sea, the men and women of VFA-137 are scattered throughout the constellation, but the focal point for the entire squadron is Ready Room 8. Here, the pilots will brief and debrief their mission, keep up with the ship squadron's progress, and just hang out. Before they set up the ready room, they move into their stateroom. Could you see anything that was really different? I couldn't last time I was out here. The Connie is no cruise ship. The passageways are narrow. This is, we call this the Lower West Side. This is the best junior officer room for the squadron. The ladder's unforgivingly steep. 132, one Lima. And the cabin, claustrophobic. Right. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Lieutenant Schmidt and White will share their small cabin with one other squadron member. Yeah, kind of like the Holiday Inn, a little bit smaller. We're actually a little bit more narrow. Personal space will consist of a desk, a set of drawers, and a bunk. But as Spartan as it is, they know that other squadron members have more obscure quarters. Berthing, their racks are a lot thicker because their mattress lifts up, and that's where they store all their clothes. All their gear. They don't get, they don't get all this they don't get stuff a, here. Uh, so those are guys that are really, dresser. they're the ones that are hurting. They come out here and they do an amazing job for very little, which is, yeah, nothing uh, hits home. Uh, like when you go down and look where those guys live and what they deal with, and still working up there every day on the flight deck, putting us off the pointy end. So. As the rest of the squadron settles in, Commander Smith and the senior members of VFA-137 prepare for their flight to the ship. And uh, for some reason, you have to come back in the break. Back on the ship in Ready 8, squadron members prepare to execute the CQ plan. They will start with the most and least experienced pilots, get the veterans finished so they can help the others, get the new guys back in the cockpit as soon as possible. That's the theory. Go at seven. Start arcing at seven nautical miles and work myself back in. The part in Rianer is not to go up to low holding. Okay. Anything else? Have fun. I'll be out there waving you. Uh, hopefully we'll have fun doing it. From Ready 8, it's a long, solitary walk to flight deck control. That's where De La Fuente will wait. Wait for the Kessel's F.A. 18 to arrive from Lemoore. That'll be good. I, you know, once I get in the plane, it'll be a lot, you know, a lot better. It's kind of a pain in the neck sitting around waiting, but uh, should be a good time. While Gimp waits for a plane, other Kessel's get to work. The choreographed dance of heavy metal has already begun on the flight deck. It may appear to be color-coded chaos, but everyone has a very specific job to do up here. No job is unimportant. Uh, we're actually on pickles and uh, on the headsets talking to the guys. We're just, uh, calling the deck clear, time and interval. Uh, just general, uh, making sure everything's good to go. The LSOs work at a frenetic pace. They're just part of a complex system that controls every aircraft movement on and around the ship. Inside lies another part of the system, flight deck control. From here, 
The handler directs and controls every move on the ship's deck. An hour after leaving the beach, Commander Smith is among the first to bring his Hornet aboard the Constellation. How's it going so far? Yeah, uh, it's going great. I'll tell you what, you know, it's amazing. You, you get the ship in sight and the heart starts racing. It doesn't matter how many times you've been out here before. It's a great feeling. 212, 10 miles, dirty up. A trap, a cat shot. It's, it's really neat. It's exciting. The guys look like they're doing well out there. Uh, I'll get the real story, obviously, uh, here in a while, but I think, I think we're doing well. One of the first stops is flight deck control, where he runs into the air wing commander, Captain Danny Newton, and meets the ship's new handler. Just to introduce my, one of my CEOs to you, Oscar Smith. How are you doing, sir? Bobby Anderson. Thanks for uh, parking me. All right. Appreciate it. You having fun? Trying to. Welcome aboard. Thanks. Thank you. And I just happened to run into the boss there, too, oh, by the way, the CAG, waiting to go flying. So, you know, that's not bad, running into the boss the first thing. So at least he knows I'm finally at work. I'm finally here. But sometimes being at work doesn't mean you're able to do your job. De La Puente's wait in flight deck control is longer than anyone anticipated. The plane he is scheduled to fly diverts to San Diego for fuel. It's late in the afternoon before he's able to launch. Then he has just enough time before dark to make only one of the four landings he needs to progress to night trap. And that one isn't as good as he would have liked. That was okay. Not that great. It's kind of, uh, you know, it takes a couple to feel out, you know, one or two to feel out where you need to be and stuff like that. So I was, I was fishing around. The air wing flies throughout the evening. 17 hours after the Constellation set sail, the Kestrel's first day at sea is almost over. It's well after midnight. But there is one more task to complete. First pass, 405. A, a little low, line up left start. Yeah. A little low in the middle. A little line up power on the corner and close. A little low flat at the ramp. OK to the two wire. OK, thank you. Commander Smith is one of the few Kestrels to get completely CQ'd on the first day. With his debrief complete, the day is done. Overall, however, the squadron didn't make as much progress as they had hoped. Deck operations were slow at times. Some pilots weren't able to fly as much as they were scheduled. We uh, crawl wise for the squadron. We didn't get as far along as we would have liked. Uh, nobody did. We could finish tomorrow, but we would have to get twice as many as we got done today. So it would have to be a uh, banner day for the second day out. It is as busy as any major metropolitan airport compressed into the space of just over four acres. The flight deck of the USS Constellation teams with human and mechanized activities, all geared to launch and recover aircraft. On the bow, two steam catapults shoot airplanes off the deck as often as 45 seconds apart. At the same time, LSOs recover aircraft over the stern at an equal rate. Operating on the flight deck is one of the most hazardous tasks a Navy pilot ever does. It's the most dangerous thing anyone on an aircraft carrier ever does. Lieutenant Bull Schmidt knows this all too well. It's much more likely that something will go wrong around the ramp than anybody ever will ever shoot at us or we shoot at anybody, so. The close proximity of aircraft to each other and to the edge of the deck, and to flight deck personnel leaves no room for mistake. Uh, it's going to be a little bit uh, tighter quarters than we have on, on land. A lot of airplanes turning, a lot of uh, the blown exhaust is hot. Uh, got to sting your eyes up there at first. And it's windy, a continuous 25 to 30 knot wind. It threatens to knock even the most cautious person into harm's way. To someone new to carrier operations like Manny De La Fuente, it can all be somewhat confusing. It's just kind of a crazy scenario. A lot of people running around, stuff like that. You know, mainly you just uh, try and 
make sure you know you're doing what you need to do. I'm starting up, getting all your stuff ready. Despite the seemingly randomness of the flight deck operation, it's all dictated by regimented procedure and by the shirt. The men and women of the flight deck crew, each one wears the color that signals their job. Aircraft directors in yellow, catapult crew in green, plane captains in brown, troubleshooters in white. I get uh, the real warm fuzzy once my troubleshooters go over the jet and say, hey, you're good to go. Uh, from that point on, checking everything over again, they're gonna put me in tension, I'm gonna go forward on throttles. Uh, make sure the motors are spooling up, everything's still looking good. Uh, feel the jet squat, feel you take tension. At that point, uh, they'll hand me off to the uh, catapult officer. They'll tell me, he'll give me this signal. I'm wiping out the controls, checking to make sure the flight control system's looking good. Then I'll start up around the cockpit again, uh, starting down on the lower right side, making sure everything looks good to go. Uh, hydraulics are good, all GDIs are set up high, I want them. Angle of attack's looking good, motors are still working. Uh, everything's right, when everything's good to go and I feel the set, uh, I'm going to give a good, sharp, crisp salute there to the catapult officer. He'll check a few more settings, touch the deck, uh, at which point my hand's coming up to the towel rack, going on to uh, military power, which I have been there, and uh, I'm just pretty much watching the guys, and I'll see when he's going to push the button. They go through their standard procedures, the guy's hands up. i got to put my head back, lean against the headrest, and, and off we go. With one hand on the throttle and the other on a bar above his head, the FA-18 pilot braces for the launch. He has to. The plane accelerates from zero to 160 in two seconds. 310 feet later, the Hornet flies itself off the end of the deck. The force of its departure sends a shudder through the entire ship. Yes, sir, you realize how physical they are, especially the catapult. Uh, we have some of the older cats on the um, CB-64, which they give you all their energy initially, so it's a big shot in the back there. Uh, they can be pretty strong. The CQ loads is not too bad, but once you start getting a full load on the aircraft, it's, it's fairly violent. It's just another day on the boat for Lieutenant Schmidt and Della Fuente, two of the pilots VFA-137 hopes to CQ today. This is where their hard work at Lemoore begins to pay off, especially the first time they turn into the groove and see the ship. Still, no matter how much he's done it, a naval aviator never takes a landing for granted. You know, but it's still it's something that you can, uh, you know, you can feel confident one minute and then uh, the next minute can, in a matter of seconds, deteriorate rapidly, so. Come on, wave off, wave off, wave off. It's not something that, you know, I think, you know, it's, I think it's something that you just always have to, you know, no matter what, just keep working to do better at. It's difficult. Falcon 414 on course on glide path, three quarter mile, call the ball. Following the glide slope down, the carrier pilot keeps the ball centered using small, rapid corrections. Roger ball, 27 knots. He adjusts power and pitch until he feels his plane slam to the carrier deck. On impact, he applies full power. If his tail hook misses one of the four arresting cables, the added power will send him airborne to try again. 705 tower. 401 going slightly above glide path on course, three quarters mile, call the ball. If he catches one, the plane will come to an abrupt stop. He'll throttle back and taxi off in time for another airplane to land right behind him. Two touch and goes, and two traps later, Schmidt and Della Fuente have successfully completed their day landing. They are ready to move on tonight. Overall, the Kestrels have done well in today's game of catch up. We're doing great. We're doing good. Uh, it was a very, very good day, very successful uh, day, daytime event. Um, we got more than 50 landings today. And if all goes as scheduled, then we'll get, uh, we'll get done tonight. But night is altogether different on the deck of a carrier. A lot more can go wrong. 
A full moon and clear sky will help, but caution is still the watchword. The evening starts with a fod walk. Everyone on the flight deck looks for debris that might get sucked into an engine. Hey, when they get... Downstairs in the Kestrel's maintenance control, they're counting their blessings. They'll have five planes working tonight. That's no small feat given the amount of activity today. So far, things are going good. We have nine aircraft out here. Uh, we've only got one aircraft down, 403, for a hard landing uh, when he trapped aboard the aircraft. Uh, the rest of them are doing well. We've got uh, four aircraft in a hangar bay, uh, and uh, the rest are on a flight deck. Uh, like I said, they're all holding up real well. Uh, no major gripes, no major problems. Uh, recent 1A. Next door in Ready 8, a different set of challenges is being discussed. Uh, lost brakes, loser brakes, parking brake, emergency brakes, hook down, lights on, start talking. Landing on a carrier deck at night is as tough as it gets in military aviation. The blackness of the sea blends with the night sky. A pilot can't tell up from down. He must trust his instrument implicitly. He must fall back on well-established habits. Fighter pilot's brain is a certain size when he's standing here on the ground and we're just talking. Put a strap on an airplane, it shrinks down to about 50% of that. It's dark outside and a lot of things are going on. You're operating on maybe 10% of what you have. So we call it STEM power. So when you're on STEM power, you really want to be able to fall back on those things you've always done. So it's the habit patterns that are going to keep you alive. Experience is something else to fall back on. But for Della Fuente, that's not an option. Next one, uh, the stress is evident on his face. As he found out earlier today, it takes several passes before an inexperienced pilot begins to feel comfortable landing on the boat. Just, uh, yeah, just kind of, I'm not really too familiar with what it look, with the, what the sight picture is supposed to look like. So uh, kind of just, again, fishing around the first couple, and then, uh, and then I kind of figured out where I needed to, to turn and stuff like that for the uh, last two. So kind of worked it out. It's kind of something that you just need to do with repetition to, to be able to see what you have to do every time be able to do it same thing every time but three traps this morning don't exactly qualify as repetition and gimp didn't consider them his best work i'm going back out tonight but unfortunately i only get two tonight so i'm sure i'll be feeling even even worse now you know feeling today della fuente heads to his plane those not flying this rotation settle in to keep score in the watchful eye right now it's a numbers game can they make the required landings in the allotted time? The evening starts well, a clear and uneventful cat shot for Gimp, but then, relatively speaking, that's the easy part. A few minutes later, with squadron mates watching below, Della Fuente rolls into the groove. It's quickly apparent his inexperience will give him trouble tonight. A few hundred feet from the ramp, he's out of lineup and out of time to correct. Wave off, wave off. He's waved off. Adding full power, he clears the ship. He'll have to go around and try again. But this time, on top of everything else, he has the added pressure of having missed his first pass. On his second pass, the setup is much better. But now, there's a different problem. The flashing letter F in the top center of the screen means there's a foul deck. Someone or something is not clear of the landing area. Gimp is just seconds away from another wave off. At the last instant, LSOs call the deck clear and Della Fuente's hornet slams home. His hook catches from 140 knots to zero in under three seconds, a successful trap. The notation in the logbook won't say it was a perfect pass, but as more experienced members of the squadron know, the most important measure of a night landing is safe and aboard. A couple decent passes after the first, uh, first rough one there. Uh, throughout the day I heard it did pretty well, so it seems it's done all right, and uh, yeah, we'll keep it. <laughs> Another launch and trap in Della Puente is CQ'd, but circumstances are conspiring against some of the remaining pilots including Bull. So we'll get who we can. I said tonight we can get Toma, uh, Bobo, 
Momentum screeches to a halt when two of the five aircraft on the flight deck go down with mechanical problems. Next up, full call, sir. Question for you. Um, do, we have, uh, do you have any idea if we have CQ spots on the airplane tomorrow, or, or what, what should we do here with the, uh, with the flex? On the other end of the phone is the squadron's executive officer, Commander Larry Burt. He's been watching over the squadron's progress with the CO in carrier air traffic control. Bert will actually take over as the Kestrel's commanding officer in a few months. Tonight, he provides leadership by advising how to juggle the schedule. Phoebe's got one to go, and Oster's got one to go. And it's Trying to rearrange an already tight schedule is a logistical nightmare. Uh, we're trying to stuff as many guys. We started trying to get 11 guys and, and then three jets here and, and three hot seats. It just doesn't work. We lose a couple people. Finally, it's clear that everyone can't see Q tonight. Two will have to finish tomorrow. Schmidt takes one of the remaining slots so he can help the rest of the squadron from the flight deck tomorrow. Launching from the deck of the Constellation, Bull's just two traps away from another CQ. He's made nearly 200 traps, assisted with hundreds more from the LSO platform. He has a fair amount of experience, enough to know just how dangerous his job really is. Uh, I, I still get scared, uh, real scared, and you get uh, kind of a little bit on edge, but that's pretty good though. It gives that little burst of adrenaline there that keeps you on edge and doesn't allow you to become complacent. Complacency hardly seems possible when the view out your cockpit looks like this. Roger ball, 27 knots. Somewhere down there are four cables. They're located in an area approximately 120 feet long. Schmidt is supposed to land his airplane so that it catches one of those cables, preferably the third, and stop. In ready room eight, squadron mates watch Bull struggle with lineup. In his case, though, experience helped. He wrestles his Hornet into the groove and onto the deck. He snags a two wire, the mark of a low approach. As Bull follows the sign language of dancing flashlight back to the catapult, Delafuente returns to the ready room. Though technically successful, his struggle in the cockpit tonight left him emotionally drained. He's in no mood to talk about the night. Another successful trap, and a short time later, Bull joins the other Kestrel pilots. Even though he had his own difficulties in the cockpit, Experience has taught him to deal with the crushing amounts of adrenaline and fear. Uh, scared, of course, because it's nighttime. I, I really don't like flying at night, but uh, it's not as scary as it used to be. Uh, but you still get that uh, good adrenaline rush there, especially uh, once you tip over three miles. And inside of a mile, as your route starts to go off again, you know, hey, it's, it's really time to get down to it. Uh, adrenaline really kicks in, and, and uh, you just do it. It's after midnight when flight ops finally end. Despite the problem, they've managed to finish just two pilots shy of their goal. Actually, we had, we had a very good night. We had a very good night. We, we batted about 80%. Um, no fault of our own that we did not get all 11 guys called that we wanted to. We got nine. It's nice to get off to a, a great start like this into a three week, two and a half, three week at sea period because it, you know, it'll just get better. For most of the Kestrels, the repetition of CQs has ended. The hard part is over. We will uh, quickly transition into the cyclic ops that we've talked about before and start flying training missions off the ship that will take us into overland bombing ranges and air-to-air -air ranges and also do some overwater work as well. There's the other target. Looks like there's a big hole in the roof. Now the fun part begins. Still, every mission requires one cat shot and one trap. It's a test every day. As any naval officer will tell you, you're only as good as your last trap. <laughs> 